Uh, we continue to work with families who have needs. Um, and we understand that some of you um, are very resilient and maybe six months ago moved in with family or friends or found other solutions and said, thank you, but I've self-resolved. Um, but we know staying with family and friends sometimes will wear very thin over a period of time. Um, and so we will continue our work. So now we move to long-term case management. So we were very fortunate that we were, the county was given an opportunity to submit a grant to the FEMA, asking them for now, we need funding. We need funding for full-time case managers. Um, and so timing and timing, right? So of course, the day that the application hits on the desk of somebody to sign it, in Washington, D.C., they decide to shut down. Uh, but, but, the, the, but the, the day, day that they, they reopened, reopened, I got an I email know, saying the state of Hawaii or the, or the county of Hawaii was, was awarded, awarded a long-term long case management grant. grant. This, this will allow us to move, move forward, forward, meaning we that all of the agencies who stepped, stepped up and worked, worked over the next nine months, months can, can go, go back to doing what they were doing. And that we can have one agency, whoever is awarded through what we call a request for proposal process, be charged, be charged with, with following, following through, through for the long, long term. term. So, so my ask, ask to you, uh, because, because you will see the data, data there are actually four databases, databases out there that we're trying to manage. manage. So the so first database, database comes from real property, property tax. tax. So those so we know, know of the, those damaged, damaged or destroyed homes, homes that's one, one database. database. If, if you, you registered, registered with FEMA, FEMA you were put in their database. If you registered with the SBA, you're in their database. And then if you registered with HIDARC, Hawaii Island Disaster Assistance Response and Recovery Team, what a mouthful, but HIDARC, you're in our database. And now our task right now is to bridge these four together so we can tell one story. So my ask to you today, if you or anyone that you know of said I was okay, but continue today to have an unmet need, I highly recommend that you contact Neighborhood Place of Puna to get into the database or to reactivate your account. Because we truly need to know who needs help. Because we talked about Joy and her hard work in getting us money. And, and so, so it's certainly, certainly not, not my position to, to, to tell you what we're going to do with that money. money. That's, That's somebody else's kuleana. My job is to make sure I tell your story to the people who are making the programs. And the only way we can get the appropriate resources is for you to tell us what your unmet needs are. Okay? So if you said I was okay, but the stay with family or friends is getting thin, or you, or you now, now need, need help, help, please contact, contact Neighborhood Place of Puna. Puna. Um, the, the last thing I want to add is that in line with this, this uh, there were about, about 600 households when we contacted, contacted maybe, maybe about six months ago, ago that, that said, thanks, but, but I no I longer need you. you. I'm, I'm good. good. Neighborhood, Neighborhood Place of Puna, Puna has been tasked to go back and make phone calls to all of these 600 families and say, hi, are you really okay? So if you get a call, don't hang up on them. <laughs> or tell your family and friends, don't hang up on them. Because all they're trying to do is really get a picture of what is the need in the community right now. So that we can go back and tell the appropriate planners and department people what the needs are. Oh. Okay. And then, so just to kind of give you a timeline, we anticipate that the long-term case management uh, will be ready for implementation sometime in early May. It's just we need to go through the procurement process. That's how it rolls. So, okay. Thank you. Okay, so can everybody actually see the slide? Yeah, so maybe if y'all pull that door, if y'all can pull that door closed for a minute. Uh, It'll be a little bit better. Okay, so what I so these are this is a snapshot of unmet needs. So what we found were there were certain categories. Um, 
that we could realistically address. So housing, huge, airfare. So airfare is like, I don't want to stay here. I have family wherever. Help me get there. Medical, counseling, financial assistance, legal aid, um, then later on, uh, building and home re uh, repairs, and then this one, which is basically what Sharon was talking about. These are folks who got help and are coming back. So you can see, I, so I took a snapshot from July, mid-July of 2018, which was basically when we hit our peak of demand. So you can see at that time, we had 626 households that needing, needed housing assistance, 155 households that wanted airfare, 37 uh, households that still had some kind of medical. So when we say medical, this is, they've reported that, you know, maybe they're on a ventilator, maybe they have something, and we just needed to make sure that a medical professional checked in with them, that they were connected. Uh, counseling, pretty self-explanatory. Financial assistance, household clothing, very broad category, but short term. Um, and then, at that time, legal aid and building and blah, blah, blah weren't on, we weren't uh, doing those yet. So then go forward to the 21st, so that was Thursday when we compiled the data. We have only 19 households right now that are identifying that still need housing assistance. We still have one person that needs airfare. Um, and we address all the medical counseling needs. There are a few, now the financial assistance more is Hawaii community assets, long-term loan kind of things. Uh, legal aid has come on board big time and is helping, so 14 right now that are getting legal assistance and then Habitat for Humanity and others are helping with long-term rebuilds and like I said, the 16 are um, folks who are coming back, we're discovering. So you can see, Back in July, 1,224 1, total households that needed assistance. Now we have 79, some of the house, 79 duplicated. So, in other words, there are a few households that have two needs or three needs, but 68 individual households that are still identified as having um, unmet needs. So, go to the next slide, please. Okay. So then what do, how do we do? So these are the needs that we met. So again, this is not federal funding, this is not state funding, this is hustle, local donations, um, people who donate. So if you donate to the Hawaii Community Foundation or Hope Services or Neighborhood Place of Puna or, or Catholic Charities or whoever, this is where your money went, basically. So we have housed 153 households, no federal money. We have managed to send 44 and provide airfare to 44 households, so whether it's a household of one or a household of six with three dogs, okay? Uh, we got 18 households connected with medical, 38 uh, connected with counseling, um, 352 got some sort of financial assistance. And again, I'm going to props out to Catholic Charities over there. Beth's in the audience, did a great job. Um, others, but you know, Catholic Charities, awesome. Uh, 14 have been gotten receipt, uh, successfully gotten assistance from uh, legal aid. And we have 16 right now, 16 thus far that have gotten um, help um, uh, making repairs. So you can see 635 total unmet needs, that's 450 unduplicated households. Well, Puna, Influence Supply Hub, and I think pretty much everybody here was there um, either getting a hug or a hot meal, making donations, and nobody asked us to do it. We just grew up knowing that if someone was in need, we needed to take care of them because it's a cockle thing to do. And so that's what we did. We provided hot meals in partnership with World Central Kitchen. We gave out supplies and everything that we had was donated from folks across the state and around the world. It was pretty amazing. Um, there have been some questions about the money that we were able to raise via our Bank of Hawaii account and GoFundMe. I'm really proud to say that we've raised a little over $200,000 and that, and that was, was parked part in a recovery account, recovery account with Bank of Hawaii, Hawaii. And it was and a special account because it was a one-way sort of transaction. transaction. Money, Money goes, goes in, in and that's, that's where it stays. 
And so the only money that has been given to date is the $30,000 that Ikaika and the captains of the hub awarded back in December to three families who lost their homes. Auntie Dottie Kaiser lost her home again in this lava flow. And so we gave three families $10,000 uh, which was given to Hansador Lumber in order to be able to buy materials for them to rebuild. Everything else, still in the bank account. And we are happy to take a picture and show you bank statements to confirm that. But thank you so much for, for your trust. Um, we really appreciate that. So I've been on the council for about three months now. I chair the planning committee. I also chair government relations and economic development. I am the alternate delegate to HSAC, which is the Hawaii State Association of Counties. I will be the delegate at the start of the next fiscal year. And I'm really excited about that in particular because I'd like to use where we are right now until 2020, which is when our county will be hosting the HSAC conference. I want to show them how we've been able to activate Puna, activate Big Island, how we've been able to energize our people and our economy despite all of the natural disasters that we've been hit with. So very, very excited about that. I love our council. We have an incredibly dynamic council. And if you go to council meetings or you watch the video on Naleo, you will see that we're listening to each other. Everyone's thoughtful and kind. We're working in collaboration. And one thing in particular that I'm pushing for is transparency. And thank you to David Corrigan, Big Island Video News, for always publishing my very passionate comments about how we need to provide transparency and detail to community. We need to be accountable for every single dollar that taxpayers give to the county and also to all the money that's coming in from the state and federal government. And so I, you know, ahead of this meeting, I wanted to compile just a list of all the funds that have been um, granted to date. And I'm going to probably create a, a nice graphic that I'll be publishing on my website and Facebook page so that the community can see where all the money has been coming from and what its intended uses are and where exactly we can engage you, the community, in helping to decide how we rebuild Puna. So $12 million came from the governor's office, and that was to support emergency response. There's a little bit of money left over, about 2.4, um, and that's going to be used to um, do renovations at the Pahoa District Park, and it's also for temporary access roads, like Highway 132. So that money has been earmarked. There's also $10 million from the governor's office for recovery and relief work. Over the last few months, I've pushed uh, the recovery team, specifically uh, Diane Lay at R&D, to work with us to identify how we can spend down that money. And the strategy was, how can you possibly be asking the legislature for $155 million when you're sitting on millions of dollars as is? I'm really proud of the fact that she and her incredible team who worked so hard, and I just have to say, folks at the county are going above and beyond their normal duties to support recovery efforts. And so you may not see a lot of it or hear a lot of it, but they are getting so much better about communicating the work that they are doing on your behalf. And so I'm pretty excited about the suite of projects that has been identified to be spent with the 10 million. And I'll just give you a rough overview, but temporary access and roads restoration, park renovations and infrastructure, housing and assistance in a community land trust, community-based mental health projects, programs for our youth. And what I'm really excited about, one of the things I asked her to put in was a food park and an agricultural hub. And the idea is if we can start putting these projects into, into work now and into the short-term future, we then can be able to identify how we want to spend down the 20 million that's being given to the county as a subsidy as part of HB 1180, um, HD1 that you know, Rep. San Buenaventura was critical in championing for. Um, and I just have to say, that $60 million appropriation from the state ledge, that's a huge deal, you guys. Everybody's saying, oh, but Kauai got $100 million. That's parked at the governor's office. It didn't go to the county. This money is coming directly to Hawaii County. It started off as $50 million, but because of this woman to my left, Joy, we were able to get an extra $10 million. That's amazing. At the end of the day, it all comes down to relationships. We've got a good team on the council and at the ledge really working for you. 
And so I do want to address somebody that asked about HB 1180. So 20 million is a direct subsidy to the county. And like I said earlier, the 10 million from the governor, these are potential projects that could essentially be accelerated or, um, or just, you know, um, sorry, brain fart here. Anyway, it can be used to inform how we spend down the 20 million. Let's figure out what sticks to what we want to grow. The $40 million will be used as matching funds for federal grants. And that's for things like infrastructure. Um, let's see. There was a $250,000 grant for economic, re or economic development strategies, and that's a plan that's being crafted now. Um, $225,000 for a hazard mitigation plan. And this is so that we have a plan in place to reduce the impact of natural disasters into the future. I mean, let's think about it. Climate change is real. Sea level rise, sea level rise is very real. And so we need to start making decisions with that in mind. And this plan will help us to do that. $25,000 for cities for in, uh, financial empowerment grant. This is a one-year planning grant that will allow us to start figuring out how we can empower people financially. And so the idea is perhaps we can stand up a center, could be in Pune, but also recognizing how big our island is and how people live in rural communities, having some kind of mobile traveling center to bring resources directly into communities. There's also been an in-kind donation for a risk assessment. And I've been pushing the recovery team to have this information, this assessment done by April, by the mayor's um, six-month moratorium on making no decisions about future of Pune. The idea is, can we put all of the information on the table and run through the various scenarios? And as a community, as policymakers, let's figure all of that out together i'm very much for pushing out information and i hope you see that i mean i think when we are all empowered with the data and what could happen we can make really reasonable and good decisions together um and you know finally i i, I just i want to thank the mayor i think a lot of times people get upset um, at him and he he takes a lot he does take a lot and I, I do hope you appreciate him being really prudent and thoughtful and just having everybody's public health and safety in mind um, he and I don't always agree and that's very apparent in some of the questions that I've asked um, on the on the council floor but at the end of the day he's got a good heart and he's got everybody's best interests in mind um, and the last thing I'm really proud of is Bill 12 that passed council on second reading earlier this week. That's $170,000 in private donations that we were able to put to work for the community right now. 50,000 for roads recovery, a little over 50,000 going to Parks and Rec to bring in emergency water as we at Pohoiki as we work with a private landowner who has a well that's going to work with Parks and Rec and um, water supply to bring permanent water infrastructure back to the park. There's also summer fund vouchers for kids. We can't forget about our kids who suffered through really traumatic year. You know, they lost their park, they lost their pool, they lost their surf spot. So we want to make this summer the best ever. Um, there's also uh, money for the Volcano Cooper Center because we can't forget about our friends in Upper Puna who suffered through uh, the, the eruption. There's also money for farmers. So critical we support the people that feed us. $50,000 going to R&D, and the bulk of that is to help provide micro-grants through the Kohala Center to farmers who, even though they lost everything, they're willing to do it again because they're so passionate about it. And so I'm so happy to be able to support them. And working with um, Leilani Estates, we were able to identify some needs and ways in which we can support them, and that is through um, the police department and um, an increased presence in security and safety. So that's everything that I'm working on, just related to recovery. There's so much more, but I'm really excited about the opportunity that we have to work in partnership um, to just really create a community where we are all stoked and thriving. So thank you. Hi everybody. So I'm Brandy Menino, Chief Executive Officer of Hope Services Hawaii. Hope Services is a nonprofit affiliate organization of the Roman Catholic Church. So we're most known for the micro housing units built most recently. 
And that build really was a community-wide effort. We were just the organization and the vehicle to help make that happen. It took local leadership, local um, contractor, Gil Alginado, his partners at Hongo Construction to help, and a partnership with HPM Building Supply to really help that build happen here in Pohoa. But we wouldn't have been able to even start the project without the, our government partners of the mayor's administration as well as the governor in their emergency declaration. So with that triggered the opportunity to make this project happen. We leased 14 and a half acres from the Catholic Church. Um, locals knew about that and brought the idea. So the contractor, Gil Aguinaldo, brought that idea to us within like mid-May, I want to say. And then at the end of May is when the government made their emergency proclamation. The next day, I got the blessings from my board you know, Brian, if you can get this project insured, if you can get the resources to make that happen, meaning build like the supplies, the materials, the money, and the people who will do it, you have our blessing to do it. The next day, we were able to get those commitments from the local leaders, the contractors. We reached out to Hawaii Island United Way. We knew they still had funding actually from Tropical Storm Izell. So we reached out to Hawaii Island United Way. They were, be, they were able to give us $125,000 for that project. That was the cash that built to that entire project, but it took over 50 business partners in our community, from the faith community as well, the Rotary and the Chambers to really make that project happen. In less than 30 days, the first 20 unit micro housing units was built in Pahoa, right next to Tin Shack Bakery. So that was an amazing project in itself. That continued to spark inspiration with our faith community partners in Connect Point Church continued and, and planned for their project in HPP for another 10 micro housing units. We continue to provide um, services out of the micro units. The mayor's emergency proclamation regarding the lava has ended in the end of this past January. Um, so the memorandum of agreement that we signed, um, our intent, we have 18 months to return the micro housing units to its original intent which was sheds, right? Basically it was a model of a shed in which APM modified it with the lean-to roof instead of a pitch roof and added a screen door and a, an additional window. So we, we have two options. You can return it to its original use or use it as homeless services. So we have since made that ask of the mayor's administration to keep Sacred Heart Shelter in Pahoa because one, we know as a homeless servicing provider, we're not going to get um, government money to build housing or shelters in Pahoa because of the lava zoning. They won't use government money in, in lava zone one or two. So before we had this opportunity, we were already on a trajectory to plan the affordable housing on that property. Uh, we're using and leveraging the opportunity right now as the governor has declared an emergency proclamation on homelessness. That was um, in relation to the Ohana Zones build in mid-December of 2018. He has since extended it uh, mid-February, so it expires in mid-April. We have less than about 50 days to make this project happen so that we can leverage this opportunity for exemptions and waivers to make this project happen. So that was one of the questions that was brought forward was like build senior housing in Pahoa. So that is our what we're trying to do um, right next to Sacred Heart Micro Units on the same property. Um, it is ag land, so there are some asks and exemptions that we have to make that hasn't been approved. So these are some of the things that the asks that we're gonna make is to ask um, to make this housing project happen. Um, the Amir's administration has been very supportive of that. We had just recently met with county department heads from the planning department, water, um, environmental management, public works, you know, all the players who, who will help us make that happen. Um, HPM Building Supply also reached out to us because they haven't stopped working. They have been working on a modular housing unit. They have uh, pre-approved designed plans in place, but they're trying to work with the county to see what the processes and what it will take to make these modular housing units happen in our community. Um, so we're really trying to partner to see in how we can make that this project happen because one of the funders that want to help us build the housing here, here 
we brought them actually before the lava and they were committed to giving us money. Then they started to be reluctant because of the lava eruption. And so one of the things was like, well, can you build housing that could be moved? Yeah, so that is the intent of the modular housing unit is that it can be movable in a truck within, uh, I believe in two pieces is what they're looking, the model prototype that they're looking at right now. So that's something that we're working on. Um, I th we continue to do that. We have, I think it's the last 19 households that need housing assistance is in the micro housing units. And I think that's all I have for today. I work for the state at the uh, Hawaii Emergency Management Agency. As you can tell, the, the, the state and federal government are uh, a, a portion of the recovery of a community that's struck by a disaster, but by far the most prevalent part of, of how a community responds comes from the heart of the community itself, and, and uh, it certainly makes me to be proud to be associated with Puna. Uh, the federal government intends to spend about $177 million or slightly more than that uh, in this disaster as uh, uh, the total funds. Of that amount, probably about 20 million somewhere in that vicinity have been spent up to this time. Uh, so the money, the money's starting to flow in for recovery. And that's interesting because as the money starts to flow in, the uh, uh, FEMA, is getting ready to leave their uh, on-site assistance. So I will have to be dealing with them at their headquarters in Oakland, which means that it's a little more difficult to communicate with them and uh, uh, to design our needs. Yeah, so at the end of the month, they're going to close the joint uh, field office which means that they will not no longer have a recovery and response uh, uh, position here. However, uh, the governor has asked, uh, the county has asked, and the federal government has agreed to open a long-range recovery office, which will keep a handful of FEMA people here and also uh, provide additional assets to the county uh, to allow the county to continue planning how to spend the money as it flows in uh, to assist in the recovery. And I think we've heard some discussions of what some of those are. Uh, my current position, besides being administrator of uh, Hawaii Emergency Management, is I was a state coordinating officer, which meant that I was the guy that had to talk to the FEMA folks every day and be sure that uh, FEMA was doing what the state and county uh, uh, needed. I am temporarily the shutdown, shutdown, state disaster recovery coordinator, which means I will be uh, again representing the state to the federal government as they, as they uh, uh, work to move grants to the county. Some of those grants will go directly to the county, some will go through state agencies, and, and uh, I'll, it'll be my job to try to uh, uh, coordinate that. There's a couple of issues that I would like to discuss because they're, they're uh, uh, pertaining. When somebody's home was damaged or covered with lava, uh, those people, after a lot of paperwork questions, uh, all sorts of administrative efforts, were granted in many cases uh, uh, funds to repair their homes. I think that maximum grant of $34,000 was given to about 188 homes. Uh, some of the additional homes were covered by private insurance. Some of them were covered by other sources of funding, but there's a group of people out there whose homes suffer damage and who qualify for uh, housing assistance. The first piece of that was that they were given this possible grant of up to $34,000.
Then there's a second program with the same eligibility requirements called rental assistance. And if rental assistance allows the federal government to cut checks to people who need to rent places because their home was damaged or destroyed. Now, that's all pretty good. The way it worked when that rental assistance started to be granted, and I don't know if anybody here has it, I suspect maybe some do, but when the rental assistance is subtracted from the amount of repair assistance you get. So if you rented for uh, four months at, at $1,000 a month, then the grant to repair your home would have dropped from $34,000 to $30,000. So a lot of people probably, I would have considered it, probably made the decision, I'm not going to ask for rental assistance, I'm going to instead stay with family and friends or find another way to do housing so that I can keep the maximum grant for my repair of my home. Additionally, rental assistance only continues for 18 months. So at 18 months, it's supposed to stop. Because of the hurricanes in Texas and Florida, the law was changed such that no longer is rental assistance subtracted from the grant to repair the home. So although you, everybody's heard that that's the way it worked when you did it, that no longer is what the law says. Additionally, the law has been changed to extend rental assistance beyond 18 months. So that means that rental assistance is, is potentially available now, such that it could go beyond that month, and the people could also get the repair assistance for the destruction of their home. Uh, the reason I'm explaining all this to you is I've been in a running gun battle with uh, uh, FEMA because they don't have rules to administer the new laws. When what happens is uh, Congress or the state legislature writes a law and the, the administrative agencies have to then sit down and turn those into rules. And those rules haven't been written so they don't know what the rules are the forms aren't done to tell you those things. However, I'm here to tell you that the, the law is retroactive to cover the period of the uh, Hawaii disaster. Two, there's two problems with it. One, you all need to know about it so that you can ask about it. So that's why one of the reasons I came today. The second thing is, is let's, there's no rules, so let's say you go ask for rental assistance now. They may provide you rental assistance, but the fact of the matter is, is unless you keep all those receipts and everything, when they come down to specify the rules, there may be trouble not having that subtracted from the, from the uh, housing assistance. Now, there's no rules, and I can't tell you what to do or what. And, and FEMA has said that they don't want to discuss the issue until they have the rules in place, and then those rules will be retroactive. But I think probably some of you are making decisions not to ask for rental assistance based on the fact that you just be subtracting it from something else. That may not be the case, and, and that's what I, I, I want you to understand. I wish, I wish I could tell you what the rules and regulations would be, but they're not written yet. But the law says that you should be able to collect both rental assistance and the maximum repair assistance. The, the second issue that's going on is uh, uh, more has to do more with the county and with the state than with individuals like you, but I'll pass it on. As we open up new areas, and make, make them accessible, them accessible as the county, county does, does that. that. Uh, for example, they opened up the area uh, that includes uh, Po'o'iki Beach Park. So as we new open up those areas, we find things in those areas that require the county to make expenditures for 
communications, uh, signage, things that weren't required before that they really don't know about until they open up the areas. In a normal emergency like flooding, those areas, the, all of this would happen in about two or three weeks after the flooding or maybe two months. And therefore, there would not be an issue. In lava, we have already lost the ability to do emergency funding to put signs and water supply in the area. We've lost the ability to do that easily, and so one of my jobs is, is to work with FEMA to try to be sure that they change the rules for the disaster to match this disaster, the lava. And so I'm working to do those things, trying to ensure that uh, 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 the county, as it tries to provide services in these isolated areas, continues to be supported by the federal government as they would have if the cause were flooding rather than lava. And other than that, uh, other than that, that's all I have. And uh, standing by up there are questions. Terry, come on up. Come on. You have got only a few minutes. And then, because we have a whole bunch of questions, okay? And um, I, I believe the police department will be able to answer some of your criminal questions. Aloha, my name is Kay Aloha, and I'm currently the treasurer for Main Street, Pahoa. My husband, Dean, and I own the bookstore across the street over there, so I've seen a number of you come in. Um, I'm here to express deep gratitude for the recognition that's been given to all of the people that have worked so hard here. That's what it's about, is bringing community together. But the nice thing is, is to have a little bit of recognition and, and thank you for all the hard efforts. We know everybody has pitched in. So I want to say thank you for that recognition. And for all of you folks that are sharing here, I learned a whole bunch of new stuff. <laughs> this is great. Our board of directors began meeting regularly, actually weekly, uh, right almost from the first drop of lava. We realized that something was here that needed to be addressed fully and with every bit of attention that we could give it. We were having mainly um, uh, meetings regularly, inviting in everybody from local, state, government, uh, different programs, all kinds of people, organizations, government, private, whatever it took. Bringing, bringing them into meetings, having conversations, we're listening to the business people, we're listening to the community. As you all know, things were evolving and, and changing so rapidly. It was daunting, it was absolutely overwhelming to be able to keep up with it all. So we decided that maybe something we could do to about midsummer, everybody was overwhelmed. Let's face it, just totally overwhelmed. We said, you know what, we can bring something together that's gonna be, bring a lift to this community. And so with a, with a lot of work and effort, we pulled together in a really relatively short time that July 21st Kokua Puna gathering. And everybody had a chance to come together, take a breather, slow down, enjoy the day, listening to music from two stages. We brought in vendors, crafters, who for periods of time lost the, uh, their places to go to work. They couldn't get to Uncle Robert's at Kalapana, where they had income from. So we just decided to bring it together and make it a day of recognizing each other, celebrating a place to hug and dance and kiss and eat food and buy fun things or whatever could happen. It was great fun for us, it was a lot of work, we were exhausted afterward, but you know what? For me the payoff was standing there in Pahoa and looking at that glow in that sky that night. It felt like a blessing, it felt like something's gonna change. We are together, we're resilient, we're a strong community. So we celebrated that. Um, another, another magic, magic day, day that came along um, after, after that, that and it's one of our regular activities, it was the 25th year of Main Street's anniversary and the 25th year of the Pahoa Holiday Parade. It was the biggest parade Pahoa has ever seen. I think that <laughs> my husband was the chair, so I feel a little proud about that. And he did a lot of work and Main Street did a lot of work and everybody that showed up pitched in. And we all enjoyed it. We all had another chance to touch base. By now the lava had quit flowing. But we had an opportunity to really stand up. The sun was shining. Kaika Marzo was our, our, our grand marshal. We had a chance to recognize his efforts and all the efforts of everyone else. So another great day, and that's something that lives in the hearts of us every year when that holiday parade comes around. 
I would be remiss if I did not mention the um, Hawaii National Park and the agreement that came together, an MOU of, uh, uh, between the Main Street Pahoa Association and the people up at the National Park who have put on permanent loan the um, exhibit of the Jagger Museum. It now belongs to this community. We're the stewards of it, we'll take good care of it, and if any of you have not yet been to the museum over at Kalaheo's in the yellow building, it is fabulous. It is fabulous. We have people coming in and speaking, our ranger guys, you'll see Philip over there sometimes, or John, or whoever's around. We're having school groups come in and having um, talks with these folks, learning about the, the, um, the events that they go on that went into what makes a volcano happen and having a chance for them to see some of the, the uh, lava and the Pele's hair and all the things, the pumice stones and all the things that, that we talk about. And well, I'd, I'd say that the way that this whole, um, you know, one more thing that we did, we just had this two weeks ago, we had the scholars piece, we can raise more money to be able to give scholarships to more graduating seniors this year. So we're really excited about that. I've had so much fun and put a lot of work and effort into working with Main Street. I do want to tell you, you do not have to be a business owner to join. You could live anywhere, you can do anything, work, not work, retired, it doesn't make any difference. You can be a member and come and meet with us and join with us. It takes all of us to make this happen. And obviously we're not at the end of the road yet. We're not at the end of the road yet. So. Um, we have a few more things that we want to say about Main Street. Thank you, everybody. Uh, aloha, everybody. My name is Amadeo. I'm with Main Street Pahoa. Um, oh, hello. hello. <laughs> All right, well, obviously, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to uh, tell you about what needs to be done now. Uh, this is probably, maybe not the right forum, but I really loved it when Joy said what, uh, what about, you know, what they're going to be doing um, going forward. And I loved Ashley's comment about activating and revitalizing. Um, Main Street Pahoa was formed over 25 years ago and is primarily concerned about the economic vitality of Pahoa and the surrounding communities. We've historically served as a liaison between the county, state, federal, business, nonprofit, and people who make up Puna. It is MSP's opinion that the businesses of Pahoa are the economic backbone of the community and we have a very, very strong back. We live and work in a socio-economically disadvantaged area and have always dealt with the challenges associated with that. Uh, it's never been easy to boot business here in Pune, but we don't want to be anywhere else. When I was first asked to speak about this today, um, I wanted to come in with all the rage and angst that's been in my heart for the last 10 months and yell and pound my fists on the table. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, but I need for all the powers that be to understand the seriousness of our predicament here in Pune and Pahoa in specifically. My home was spared and my businesses are hanging on, so I'm fortunate, but we are not out of the woods yet. As many of you know, the volcano erupted in early May and immediately caused widespread panic and a mass exodus from Pune. The governor and the mayor both publicly stated, do not come to Pahoa, and people listened. New ag news agencies from around the world arrived and continued to voice this rhetoric and made it appear that the disaster was even worse than it actually was. This translated to a massive loss of sales for all of the businesses across the board. And in fact, the loss was felt statewide and really was not based on facts other than the media's fear-mongering and general paranoia. There was a severe lack of planning on what to do in the major eruption, and granted the size and scale was unprecedented, but some sort of plan should be in place moving forward. The economic impact during the eruption was catastrophic, with POA businesses suffering as much as 80% loss in revenues, and this is further exacerbated by many businesses having to lay off, in some cases, fire employees in order to survive. 
That lasted for months, and many businesses were forced to close due to lack of sales. In addition, many other businesses were actually destroyed, like farms, nurseries, ranches, and of course, vacation rentals. Of course, all of this associated services, such as landscapers, cleaners, handymen, and even the realtors and property managers felt the impact. By our reckoning, vacation rentals accounted for more than 1,600 visitors to Pahoa per week. And if you combine that with the service people who came from Pahoa on their way, it pushes it up to well over 2,000 people a week. 2,000 people who are no longer passing through town. The ramp, while not destroyed, is no longer functional. It is the second most commercially productive fishing launch in the state of Hawaii. Add to that the people who are forced to relocate and are no longer living and working around Pahoa, and it's clear that the long-term economic impacts are staggering. All this was clear fairly early on in the eruption, and after many, many pleas of local businesses, the community, uh, businesses in the community, the county and the state changed their messaging. The Hawaii Visitors Bureau helped with this as they quickly realized they needed to do some damage control because our visitor problem was becoming the state's tourism problem. In an attempt to mitigate some of these losses, we as a community begged for a viewing area to be set up post haste, and the mayor agreed and said hopefully within a few days we would have something. That was on July 17th. That did not happen because it was deemed too dangerous. The eruption was over in October. It still has not happened. We were told that in the coming we were told it was coming for months and months and to be patient. Meanwhile, businesses have continued to shutter. The county also suggested private parties would be allowed to set up other venues to attract tourism and that they would be assisted with expediting permitting and zoning issues in order to help alleviate the ongoing fiscal disaster. We haven't seen evidence of that as of yet. In fact, the uncertainty about the geological future of the area seems that it is less likely to expedite projects in Lower Puna. Current economic conditions are bleak. Sales during this, the usually busy part of the year, are about 50% on average below what they were last year prior to this eruption. This time is supposed to be the period where we can make enough sales to carry us through the slow part of the year. It is not. We are truly afraid of what is to come, and many more businesses are likely to fold if there is not significant help in Puna. Um, Businesses in our area are faced with a lot of uncertainty. We are uncertain as to how the state is planning on helping us. We are uncertain as to whether to, we're going to have our infrastructure rebuilt and how fast this can be done. And we are uncertain about the housing, where the housing will be rebuilt and whether, where and how the county will allow it. We are uncertain about what type of access farmers, residents, and visitors will be allowed. We're uncertain about when and where our boat ramp will be reconstructed or restored. One thing is certain. We do need assistance. Yes, we need to plan in the long term. Yes, we need to adjust our vision of what Puna can and will be. But more importantly, we need aid now. The businesses in the community can no longer wait. We need action now. Not how yet. That action should come in the form of rebuilding our, and by our, I mean lower Puna, infrastructure as fast as possible. We need our roads back, we need our boat ramp back, and we need our farms back. We need our vacation rental businesses back, and we need our visitors back. I have heard folks say that there are only 70 families that can't access their homes. The implication is that they're, they're the only people affected by the lack of roads. Well, that's far from accurate. All those folks driving around and through other communities whose roads were never designated for this kind of traffic every day would disagree. And all those folks that live in those communities and are seeing unprecedented volume of traffic would disagree. The tour companies and independent visitors who can't access the amazing places that were created during this event would disagree. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I've also heard folks say, especially people outside of the Pune district, that the whole island was affected. That's true, but by what degree and to what duration? That remains to be seen. My, my gut feeling is that they're, they're in recovery mode, and we here in Pune are still in crisis mode. I've heard it said that investing in Pune is a waste of money because the threat of inundation is present. Well, Pune has always been under the threat of inundation to some degree, and we have always been an asset to the rest of the state. We are a huge tax base with the fastest growing population in the state. Investing on our infrastructure is a wise investment and is an investment that will continue, has and will continue to pay dividends to the rest of the state for many years in the future. This is where the World Watched events unfold last year and 
Almost anyone who plans on visiting Hawaii wants to come to Puna. In this, if the state and the county help us to revitalize our account, community, we can be the new gateway to the volcano. We can continue to be major contributors to the rest of the state through our diversified economy and our unique landscape and incredible local culture. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Um, Amadeo and Terry and you folks know we're listening to you folks because that's how I got the 60 million. That's the reason why we have all of these bills. So we are we are fully aware of the problem, but we have questions and answers. Um, my name is John Brisky. I'm the newest commander for the Puna District. I've been here about four weeks. I see a lot of familiar faces out there. Um, of that know me from when I was the community policing out here about 10 years ago. Um, Puna is a place that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is where I was raised, and this is also where I live. Um, I, I came here today not to be a speaker. I wasn't on the panel, so I kind of got blindsided. Thank you very much. I guess that's my fault for coming in uniform. But uh, the question was passed on to me about how can you help keep us from being robbed in the emergency? Um, I'm not sure if that was actually directed towards the police department, but I'll try my best to answer that question. You know, whenever I'm posed with something, I like the saying, uh, think globally and act locally, okay? There's disasters all across the world, and no matter what you see about a disaster, the one thing in common is unfortunately people will get taken advantage of crime will happen that has happened in every disaster around the entire world so what can we do to minimize that because we can't eliminate it but we can minimize that okay when it comes time for evacuation unfortunately it, it, it is incumbent upon the person that's evacuating you have to make sure you get your valuables out of there Make sure you get your medication out of your house. And then there's the items that maybe aren't, don't have monetary value, but sentimental value that you want to remove from there. I don't have a silver lining to this answer, okay? So the best thing that we can do is minimize the people that are re-entering the, the evacuation zone and rely upon our assistance from our partners, from National Guard, Reserves, to assist us in the patrols in that area because we're stretched then also with the evacuation. There is no single answer for this question. If there was, it would be something that would be replicated at every disaster around the world. Um, it's an unfortunate human response to this situation. Um, it's not a question that was given a card to, but I was asked to speak briefly on it, and that is the squatter situation. Okay, there's a difference between squatting and eviction processes. Okay, if someone ever had legal right to be in the house, whether it be a oral contract or a written contract, that's eviction. Okay, squatting is when someone never had the right to be in that house from the beginning. And that's something we've seen rampant, not only here in, in Lower Puna, but the entire Puna district and the entire state actually, because we have a lot of homes that are vacation rentals that are, that are unoccupied and people seem to move into them. The biggest challenge the police department has had is contacting the actual owner of the home, whether it be a person or a bank. Um, our current laws, if, you, if anyone can access the county tax maps and see who the last owner was, that information is so outdated, it's unbelievable. Um, I'm calling people every week and I find out they've, they've passed away years ago, that property hasn't been in their name forever, so we have our challenges. But I want you to know we're on the cusp of an unprecedented cooperation between law enforcement and our government, other government partners. Um, our council people as well as our state representatives have um, moved to change our laws and increase the the, the homeowner's responsibility to keep those things updated and like um, was pointed out, laws to get these homes used in a more positive manner. So as we move forward, I believe these are situations that we'll be able to address quicker and more efficiently. 
Um, in the meantime, we won't stop trying to get a hold of these homeowners. It's something that is very frustrating, I know, for, for the neighborhoods these homes are in, as well as for law enforcement. But uh, like I said, uh, we won't stop trying to address these situations and working cooperatively with everyone, uh, the neighborhood, and our other government partners to try and move forward with this. Uh, thank you very much.